What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for The Age of Decadence. Now to get my normal stuff out of the way right out of the gate here, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers and content creators. And while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you go to my YouTube channel and you're not subscribed, the very first thing you'll see is a video explaining everything that I go over. My Steam profile is also public and linked in the description below. That said, Age of Decadence is a game a lot of people have asked me to take a look at as a channel that focuses a lot on isometric CRPGs. This is one that will come up. It is a relatively recent entry, with its release date being all the way back in 2015, and the game itself is a post-apocalyptic CRPG that takes place in a sort of low-magic reimagining of Rome. Honestly, you'll notice a lot of similarities to the Fallout franchise, at least the first two entries, one and two, but nonetheless, this game is a bit different and manages to find some uniqueness in there as well. Now, before we dive too far into this, I do want to make a mention that the game itself, it's still Steam page as well as the introduction to the game all go to pretty great lengths to explain that this is an RPG that is essentially not for everyone. It's very possible to fail or back yourself into a corner, at which point you're just going to have to reload an earlier save, so save scumming is kind of a, I would say, decent part of the game, actually. There's some trial and error to it. And in this way, what your character is capable of doing is not always everything, quite frankly. In many cases, the game is very replayable because your character cannot do everything in a single run. And in many cases, you have to choose kind of a different approach, if you will, just to get by sometimes. And we'll of course kind of discuss that, but it's worth mentioning that the game itself does do a lot of heavy lifting in this regard to explain this to people. First and foremost though, we're going to talk a bit about the story itself. Now there's going to be some minor spoilers here. In general, I try to give a plot setup at the start of these reviews, but I try not to spoil too much. But due to the nature of of this particular story, it's kind of hard to tell you much of anything that I wouldn't consider a spoiler to some degree, so expect some minor spoilers here. Now, the actual story itself, the beginning of it, changes a little bit depending on your character background, which we'll get to here in just a second, but while the exact opening scene, if you will, will change a bit, there's not a lot of motivation for your individual character in terms of the story right out of the gate. Pretty much you're directed to joining a guild or solving a local problem, that then evolves into the broader narrative. The game itself is split up into three acts, the first one being the starting area of Tehran, the second being Madorin, and then the third when you get to Ganazar. When you get to each of those new towns, or you choose to go there, the game will shift its act, if you will. This is important because some things do change and become unavailable as you progress through the game. And I would tell you, the shift can be a little sudden. Sometimes just completing your guild quest or your simple action of going to the next town will actually shift the act on you. And I think it's important to know that ahead of time. It will save you a little bit of headache. Now, the broader narrative of the game really doesn't come into focus till the end. Most of what you're dealing with as you play through the game and its acts are usually more local drama, stuff between guilds and the ruling houses of the current landscape. That said, broadly speaking about the story, there are a ton of endings, not all of them good. In many ways, I would consider several endings for the game arguably not good at all, actually kind of bad. But there's some room for interpretation there, and there are more traditional good endings as well. Again, kind of just depends on how you played through the game. Moreover, I wanted to mention that for the story, it's very replayable. My first run-through was more of a pacifist build, and that run through took me maybe five hours. However, I was still discovering new things on like playthrough six and seven. So there's a lot of stuff to see and you're not going to see it all in one go. But from there, let's talk about character creation and builds. As if you do any amount of research into this game, this is something you're going to hear about a lot. Now, broadly speaking, the character creation system is, in my opinion, very similar to Fallout's special system. However, combat and civil skills are divided into two separate things. Now, the first thing you do in character creation really is pick a background. This is similar to a class in some ways, but not exactly. Your backgrounds will give you a sort of pre-generated character that is good at one particular thing and will kind of push you towards a specific guild or faction to play through the game with. Now there is a drifter background, which is a little more freeform, though you can customize 
each individual character's stats and skills. But the backgrounds kind of push you in the right direction for a particular play style, which I thought was pretty helpful. Now from here we have stats and skills. Stats, as well as skills, will later become skill checks, so these are actually pretty important. Your base stats can be adjusted through various means a little bit later in the game, but this is typically speaking temporary and comes via buffs, that type of thing. But for the most part, the stats you pick at the beginning of the game are pretty static. And then these will inform your skills and skill points potentially that you will then be able to pick. Now, as you go throughout the game, either engaging in combat or finding more civil ways to step around combat situations, you'll earn the appropriate skill points. In some cases, you'll earn general, which can be spent on both, but there's an essence of a level by doing system here that will see you getting either more combat or more civil skill points, which makes leaning into a build very important, as trying to go broad and put points into a bunch of different things really isn't going to work. Again, the game's pretty good about explaining this. Now there is, nonetheless, a bit of an uneven representation in terms of the stats and the skills. For instance, the charisma stat doesn't see as much use, the etiquette skill doesn't see a lot of use, and then other skills actually see a lot of use. For instance, intelligence comes up a lot, lore comes up a ton, streetwise and persuasion are big if you want to go pacifist. But I would tell you, Depending on your background, the character creator will actually highlight specific options for that class that are recommended, if you will. So again, the game does a lot of work pushing you in the right direction. And while it is very possible to make a wrong decision, as long as you're saving regularly and paying attention, I don't think it's a big deal. And to that end, I would not deviate from what the game is recommending to you too much, especially on a first playthrough. There's not a lot of room for hybrid builds or experimentation here as the character builds themselves are a bit narrow. Now, in another part of the screen here, we can see our reputation. This is largely affected by our background, as well as things like prestige and body count. These are other types of skill checks we'll see presented throughout the game. These are used less often, but they do occasionally come up. Obviously, the more people you kill, the higher your body count, and sometimes you can use that as a skill check, even though it's not a skill in the traditional sense. Now, from here, let's talk gameplay and world building. Probably the most important thing to understand right off the bat is the skill checks themselves. As you progress through the game, it's fairly text heavy, so this will be a screen you'll see often, but you'll have options to pick a variety of skill checks. Obviously, you want to pick the skills that you actually have, and trying to do things you are not specced into would be ill-advised. However, this is a pass or fail system. This is not a chance-based system. There's no percentages. You either have the skills to pass the check, or you don't. Now, in most cases, this is simple your skill rank versus the check, and you either pass or fail. However, sometimes you will see situations where there are two skills involved. For instance, something might be streetwise and persuasion. In these cases, this tends to go one of two ways. You can either have a partial success where you succeed one of those roles, or in some cases, the role itself seems to be combined, where you have to pass a combined number of those two things to then pass the check. Another thing to keep in mind is the effect of the thing you are choosing. While it's good to understand how skill checks are working, it's also important to understand what you are actually Actually passing because passing a skill check isn't necessarily always a good thing. It might lead to a situation you didn't want yourself in, or it might lead you down a path you simply do not have high enough skills to continue down. But again, save often, save all the time. Save scumming is honestly a pretty big part of this game in my opinion, and as long as you're doing that, this is not a huge deal. Again, the game is relatively short, so worst case scenario, you lose a few minutes, you reload, you're right back into trying all this stuff out. But it is important to understand what your character is actually doing when they're performing these skill checks. Now, beyond that, that in terms of the rest of the gameplay, as I mentioned, very text heavy. You will see these big text walls in front of you. There's no voice acting or anything. So for some people, that's a bit of a deal breaker. You will have to read all this stuff. However, there is a good bit of running around as well. You'll be able to explore each individual town and you can actually fast travel within the towns themselves. And then there are locations out in the world you can also fast travel to. So there's a good amount of exploration in this way combined with your skills. You can actually find a lot of really cool and interesting stuff out in the world. However, at the same time, a big portion of the game is handled through these text events, 
at times, in my opinion, a little too much. There are instances in which I kind of wish the game would have let me puzzle it out rather than bring up this text event, which kind of clearly lays out the options. Now, broadly speaking, I would tell you with this game, I had the most fun with a non-combat playthrough, kind of like playing it as a more narrative game or a visual novel where I built a character with certain skills that then were then handled in these text events, and I avoided combat altogether. And in many ways, that was the way that was most rewarding to play for me personally. As in this manner, you get to explore a lot of the world without focusing too much on the combat itself. Now, there is a lot of world building that goes into this game. The world itself is hundreds of years post-apocalypse. It was a very highly technological as well as magical world that came beforehand. And there was a war that I don't want to spoil too much here, but gods were involved, magi were involved, and this war effectively destroyed the world. And now you have all these people just trying to pick up the pieces. The world itself is largely ruled by three ruling houses, and then there are several other factions that heavily influence the politics of who is left. There is the Commercium, which is the traitors, the assassins, the boatmen of the sticks, the Imperial Guard, which technically serve all of the houses, but also have their own ambitions and goals, there's the Thieves Guild, and then there's the actual ruling houses themselves. You can choose to join each and every one of these factions, which offers you a way through the game. Moreover, each background is kind of tailored after one of these approaches to the game. They kind of give you a character that would be well-suited to serve one of these particular guilds or factions. Obviously, the backgrounds are pretty self-explanatory for this. If you pick a thief, you're usually better off going with the Thieves' Guild. If you pick an assassin, you're better off going with the Boatman of the Sticks, the Assassin's Guild, that type of stuff. Now, interestingly enough, though, each individual faction does have multiple routes through their quest. Line. In fact, you can often betray your own guild in some way in many cases. In fact, most of the factions have at least two to three routes through them, which does lead a little bit to the variation of the skills, but by and large, each individual guild requires a certain skill set, and deviating from that, again, is usually a bad idea. Now, let's talk combat. 9 out of 10, it's best avoided, but I also don't think it's as bad as a lot of what I'd heard about the game made it out to be. Towards the beginning of the game, it can definitely be a bit difficult, but you can kind of spec into combat, which will make it a lot easier on you. And typically speaking, if you're playing this game, you're either going to be building a more skill-focused character or an actual combat spec character, which usually involves specializing in one type of weapon, either dodge or or block. You don't usually go both. You either block with a shield or you just dodge. And then you can potentially rank up critical strike as well. And then on the civil side of things, you can usually throw in alchemy and crafting to diversify a bit. But that's about as far as you're going to go, typically speaking, with a combat-oriented character. Nonetheless, though, there are a good few variations to the combat. There's a lot of weapons to choose from, a lot of armor to choose from. I would tell you, you're going to get the best stuff from crafting and alchemy, though. So while you can find a lot of equipment, equipment and you can buy a lot of equipment. In most cases, you're going to make the best stuff, and I think this is especially true when it comes to alchemy, because alchemy actually offers a lot of options for you, especially when it comes to bombs. One of the easier ways to approach combat is to actually get some alchemy and start making bombs, because these will do a ton of damage to a lot of enemies, and one of the cruxes of combat is that you are, typically speaking, outnumbered by a lot. So while toe-to-toe -to -toe with any one enemy, it's usually a pretty fair fight, you're usually just outnumbered. So a big part of this turn-based action point system is finding ways to skew the action economy in your favor, and as someone who does a lot of that, I didn't find that particularly challenging. Nine out of ten, there are some combat encounters that were actually very difficult, but typically speaking, with things like bombs, I was able to skew things in my favor. In addition to these things, you can equip items to your belt slot, which will, of course, let you use them in combat for a variety of AP, and then your actual weapon itself does have abilities. You have either a fast, normal, or power attack, which will affect various types of armor as well as your chance to hit. For instance, fast attack does the least amount of damage but has the highest chance to hit, but in some cases this isn't enough to actually get through enemy armor, in which case you need to either use regular or power attacks. In addition to this, you can also use things like aiming at a particular area of the body or a whirlwind attack, all of which usually cost more AP and also 
sees you take a hit to your chance to hit. So there's a lot of balancing there, as in most cases, combat is you versus a bunch of enemies. There are, however, instances of combat where you're actually surrounded by allies, and those combat encounters, typically speaking, are usually a bit easier as long as you can keep yourself alive. Now, all of this kind of culminates in a combat that is difficult at the start of the game, but towards the end of the game, if you're actually kind of specking into things and getting better at it, using consumables that are available to you, you should be able to turn this in your favor to where combat gets, for the most part, outside of a few instances, pretty easy towards the end of the game, provided you have a character built for that. All of that said, guys, let's talk positives, negatives, and wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side of things, I think The Age of Decadence is a very replayable game with tons of interesting options and choices. I think there's many, many ways you can play through this game, a lot of which are enjoyable. I think you get the most fun out of it if you plan on replaying it. If you play through it once or twice, you're probably not going to see the full picture. And as such, there's a lot of choice and consequence, and I really enjoyed that stuff. Now, on the negative side of things, I think the character building is a little too narrow. There's just really not a lot of room for experimentation that doesn't result in you having to reload a ton or just lose playthroughs altogether, which, as a lot of people like to point out, leads to a pretty negative experience, especially when you look at the, again, skill representation across the game. Some skills are just much less used than a lot of the other ones, which means there's a lot of wrong choices, and at that point, your choice is to basically experiment and find what works, or just look up a build guide, and a lot of people aren't fans of that type of gameplay. The other negative for me was uh, the UI, honestly. I get that they were kind of going for a Fallout-esque thing here, but this is a very old inventory system, and it was clunky then and it's clunky now and I'm not a fan. And while personally I consider the graphical style more of a neutral point than anything, I don't care enough about graphics to really ding a game for that kind of thing, but some people will look at this game and notice it is very dated. If you were listening earlier, this came out in 2015, the same year The Witcher 3 did, so it was pretty dated even when it released. Which in terms of graphics I'm willing to forgive, but the UI is very clunky especially for a game that came out in 2015. All of that said, guys, let's actually talk conclusion here. For starters, The Age of Decadence is very cheap. You can pick this up for, I believe it is $13 full price. It actually regularly goes on sale. I think I picked this up for like a couple bucks. And for a couple dollars in some instances, or 13 at full price, you can get, if you actually go through and do everything, easily like 80 hours worth of game, which is a pretty good value proposition. But in terms of the game itself, I think it accomplishes what the developers set out to do, which was to make a choice and consequence based CRPG set in the post-apocalypse. It has an interesting world that was fun to discover and find more and more about as I replayed through the title. And while the game definitely does have some shortcomings, you can really nonetheless see the love that was poured into this thing. And in that way, and in some ways because of that, I had a lot of fun playing this title, even if it, yes, obviously has a lot of rough spots. To remind you guys, if you didn't know, this is the first game from Iron Tower Studios. It was made largely while they were working part-time on the title. They were not actually fully developing this game purely. A lot of them were working other jobs while making this game, and I can appreciate that dedication. Moreover, this particular studio is actually working on another game now called Colony Ship, which seems to be, at the very least, trying to expand and move forward a little bit. I've actually covered that game previously. I'll probably do an update having kind of completely finished The Age of Decadence, their first game now. But in conclusion, I would say The Age of Decadence is a wonderful sort of cult classic CRPG. It has a lot of flaws, sure, but I think that's easily overlooked for A, the very cheap price of the game itself, and the fact that while you might not enjoy some aspects of the game, there's probably a playthrough in here that is well-suited for you in particular. For me personally, I had the most fun, again, playing it largely as a visual novel, and avoiding combat altogether, actually. But that, guys, is going to wrap it up and kind of give my full thoughts on The Age of Decadence, a very interesting title that was the first game for Iron Tower Studios. So, hope you enjoyed the video, If you did, like, comment, subscribe. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.